In Royal Archives, some objects are just relics, unless you discover they contain the 500-year-old DNA of Anne of Cleves. Her story is tied to Henry VIII, a failed Tudor marriage, and layers of rumor. But now confirmed biological traces have been decoded and the results defy every accepted narrative. If provenance and genetic evidence both point to an impossible truth, what have historians misunderstood until now? Anne of Cleves was born in 1515, the daughter of John III, Duke of Cleves in the heart of the Holy Roman Empire. Her early years unfolded in Dusseldorf, shaped by the expectations of a noble household and the shifting alliances of Reformation Europe. At 24, Anne's life changed course when her brother's alliance with Protestant states caught the attention of Henry VIII. The English king, searching for a powerful continental partner, arranged a marriage that would tie England to the German states and counter threats from Catholic France and Spain. The marriage treaty, signed in late 1539, promised Anne a generous dower and the rights of a queen consort. In January 1540, Anne arrived in England, stepping into the elaborate world of the Tudor court. The union, however, quickly soured. Henry's disappointment after their first meeting at Rochester became infamous. By July 1540, the marriage was annulled on grounds of non-consummation and political expediency. Anne accepted the settlement, receiving the title King's Beloved Sister and retaining her status and income. Unlike Henry's other wives, Anne remained in England for the rest of her life. She managed estates such as Hever Castle and Richmond Palace, maintained cordial relations with the royal children, and built a reputation for dignity and discretion. Outliving Henry and most of his queens, Anne died in 1557. The careful preservation of her personal belongings and household items, protected by her status and steady position, would later provide rare physical links to her story. Estate ledgers, royal inventories, and museum accession logs form the backbone of any claim to authenticity for objects linked to Anne of Cleves. The earliest surviving references to her personal effects appear in the state papers, where folio entries from the 1540s detail dower goods and property settlements following her annulment. While these records confirm the existence of valuable textiles and devotional items, their descriptions often lack the specificity needed to match them to surviving artifacts. Over the centuries, gaps in documentation widened. By the time objects attributed to Anne began appearing in 18th and 19th century estate sale catalogues, such as those cited in the Ramsden family archives and the Gentleman's Magazine of 1836, the direct line from Tudor ownership had already grown faint. When objects did resurface, museum accession files took over the paper trail. The Victoria and Albert Museum lists accession number P.153, colon 1, comma 2-1910 for a portrait miniature long associated with Anne, supported by detailed collector records from the 1720s onward. Yet even with conservation logs and transfer notes, these documents rarely bridge the centuries-long silence that follows Anne's death in 1557. Auction records, probate inventories, and private collection ledgers fill in some of the blanks, but always with caveats about undocumented intervals or restorative interventions that may have altered the original material. Archivists, aware of these limitations, have compiled chain of custody dossiers for every object considered for scientific analysis. Each one includes folio numbers, accession IDS, and references to correspondence such as Chapuis's dispatches, but also highlights where tradition, rather than proof, sustains the link to Anne. The result is a provenance landscape defined by strong traditions and high-quality materials, yet shadowed by periods of uncertainty, facts that any scientific testing must acknowledge before moving into the laboratory. Inside a climate-controlled laboratory, the lead geneticists began with fibres and keratin fragments, believed to originate from Anne's household. Each sample entered a dedicated clean room where positive air pressure and HEPA filtration minimized airborne particles. Technicians wore full body disposable suits, double gloves, and face masks, changing gear between every procedure. Sterilized scalpels and tweezers extracted fibers from textile interiors, always away from any modern adhesives or conservation treatments. For every sample, a detailed chain of evidence log tracked its journey, recording each moment from removal to analysis. Extraction protocols followed the Dabney silica-based method, adapted for ultra-short DNA fragments. The process started with overnight digestion in buffers containing proteinase K and dithiothritol, 
breaking down keratin and releasing any trapped genetic material. Samples underwent parallel extractions using Tween 20 to boost library complexity and reduce inhibitors. Throughout extraction blanks, tubes processed without any sample ran alongside to detect even trace environmental or reagent contamination. Only samples with clean blanks advanced to the next stage. The DNA itself was in pieces often less than 40 base pairs, far shorter than what most forensic labs encounter. To rescue these fragments, the team used a single stranded library preparation technique, maximizing retention of the tiniest molecules. Each DNA strand received a unique molecular identifier, UMY, allowing bioinformaticians to track and remove duplicates and spot any cross-sample contamination. Partial uracil DNA glycosylase treatment removed most ancient damage while preserving terminal signals critical for authentication. Every step, from buffer preparation to pipetting, was documented for audit and peer review. Sequencing libraries underwent pilot runs to estimate the proportion of authentic human DNA. In most ancient textiles, recovery rates fall below 5%. Here, optimized protocols and careful sample selection pushed yields higher than expected for 16th century material. Bioinformatic pipelines then filtered out modern contamination, relying on DNA fragment length, terminal damage signatures, and UMI tracking to confirm the ancient origin of each molecule. Only after these layers of protection and verification did the team proceed to analyze traits and ancestry, confident that the genetic signals reflected the Tudor era and not the modern world. Hans Holbein's portrait of Anne of Cleves, painted in 1539, captured a poised young woman with clear, fair skin and calm blue-gray eyes. This image, created for diplomatic negotiations, stood in stark contrast to the later rumors that swept through Henry VIII's court. As the marriage unraveled, courtiers circulated slanderous descriptions, calling Anne unattractive and even questioning her health, claims that would echo through centuries of popular history. Yet the genetic evidence recovered from textile and keratin fragments tells a different story, grounded in physical data rather than political intrigue. Analysis of the HERC2 and OCA2 genes, key determinants of eye color, revealed a high probability for lighter pigmentation. The presence of the AA genotype at RS1291383 supported by red depths exceeding ninefold points to blue or grey eyes, matching Holbein's depiction and aligning with Northern European averages for the period. Skin pigmentation markers including RS1689, 1982 and RS1426654. Both indicated alleles for very fair skin, consistent with Fitzpatrick type 1 to 2. These results, derived from ancient DNA fragments less than 40 base pairs long, were authenticated through damage profiling and contamination controls, leaving little doubt about their origin. No genetic markers associated with visible deformities, chronic illnesses, or rare hereditary diseases were detected. Collagen-related alleles suggested robust connective tissue, supporting contemporary accounts of Anne's health and resilience. In fact, the absence of disease-linked mutations often present in European royal bloodlines stood out, reinforcing descriptions of Anne as healthy and composed. Historians have long argued that the negative portrayals of Anne were shaped by the political needs of Henry VIII's advisers, especially after the King's disappointment at Rochester. The genetic portrait not only supports Holbein's artistry, but also exposes the calculated nature of Tudor court slander. In this light, the evidence restores Anne's image, shifting it from caricature to credible likeness, and invites a broader look at her ancestry and the networks that shaped her fate. Genetic sequencing revealed more than a simple German heritage. Anne's mitochondrial DNA carried a rare branch, likely H1E1B, found in less than 1% of medieval aristocratic remains from the Rhine and the Low Countries. This maternal lineage stretched beyond Dusseldorf, hinting at connections that reached into the southern Netherlands and into the borderlands of western Poland. These findings align with the shifting borders and dynastic marriages of late medieval Europe, and they suggest a broader continental network rather than a strictly localized family heritage. Stable isotope values from keratin derived traces, delta 13C around minus 19.6 and delta 15N near 11.4, pointed to a diet richer in freshwater fish than was typical for English nobility, closely matching patterns seen among high-status families in the Rhine Delta. 
Textile chemistry and trace minerals reflected both continental and English environments, supporting a life shaped by cross-border movement and noble tradition. Together, these clues painted Anne as part of a broader continental network, her daily life bridging cultures and regions far beyond the confines of the Tudor court. Advancing this research will depend on rigorous collaboration and independent verification. Scholars are calling for targeted archival searches in Dusseldorf and the Low Countries, where ducal records and estate inventories may clarify maternal line ambiguities revealed by the rare haplo group. Comparative analysis with ancient DNA from regional aristocratic graves could test the lineage hypotheses raised by these findings. Given the methodological challenges of ultra-degraded textile DNA, every result must be replicated in a second, independent laboratory before it can be accepted as definitive. Researchers emphasize that no single dataset is sufficient, and cross-referencing genetic, archival, and material evidence is now the standard. The next phase will require access to underexplored archives, coordination with European ancient DNA centers, and the willingness of museums and private collections to support careful, contamination-controlled sampling. Only through these combined efforts can the story of Anne of Cleves' ancestry be fully resolved. Today, centuries-old DNA can upend what textbooks and portraits claim. As genetic tools redraw the boundaries of royal identity, history grows less certain and more human. The facts we uncover now reshape not just the past, but the stories we tell about power, truth, and ourselves.